Would you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So as I said at the beginning of worship, and as you know, if you've been here for the last several weeks, we are walking alongside Peter in this Lenten season, reflecting on moments of his journey as a follower and disciple of Jesus. Peter's a good companion because like us, he's a little all over the place. At some points, he is eager and enthusiastic. At others, he's doubtful and uncertain. Two weeks ago, we heard Peter's A-plus answer to Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? The Messiah, the Son of the living God, Peter answered. But then last week, we listened as Peter struggled to understand why a Messiah would say that he must suffer and die. Stop saying that. Peter insists, to which Jesus replies, get behind me, Satan. We considered how perhaps those words, get behind me, were a way of putting Peter back in his proper place as a disciple, behind Jesus, to be one following, watching, asking and learning from Jesus as he and his wandering heart continue on the journey of faith. Now, last week we were in chapter 16 of Matthew's gospel, and between those verses and today's, a lot has happened. Peter's seen a lot. He's followed Jesus to the top of a mountain, the transfiguration we heard about right before Lent began where Jesus appears with Moses and Elijah, and a voice from heaven speaks, and Peter wants to build some permanent structures so they can stay there. And then Peter's come down the mountain and watched as Jesus healed an epileptic child. He's engaged in a somewhat confusing conversation about temple taxes that involved Jesus telling him to go catch a fish that would have a coin in its mouth to pay the temple tax. I do not have a sermon for you on that one today. (laughs) And then again, Jesus has spoken of his betrayal and death. And so in today's passage, we pick up with Peter asking this question, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Should I forgive as many as seven times? Last week, we talked a bit about Brian McLaren's different stages of faith and how that first stage simplicity is one where we want there to be clear answers, right or wrong, black or white. Peter's question here sounds a bit like that. What number is the right number? Jesus. And perhaps that's true. It makes me think about the commercial from my childhood where someone asks an owl, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? Does anybody else remember that? One, two, three. Maybe that's what Peter wants. He just wants Jesus to say, no, no, seven times is too much. The right answer is three. But I believe that Peter's question here, and most certainly Jesus' answer, conveys something more complex and more difficult. Because anyone who has ever been hurt or harmed, or who has been the one to hurt or harm, which is to say, all of us, we all know that there is no easy formula for forgiveness. If we look at Peter's question here in the context of the larger chapter, though, I think we get some important context clues. 
The verses we read today are part of a larger segment of Matthew's Gospel that scholars often call the fourth discourse, one of five sections that the author compiled as they told their version of the story of Jesus. Now, I will not be going into what all those five discourses are or what all of them mean, but I do want to point out that it reminds us that these accounts of Jesus' life and teaching that we have in the Gospels are not play-by-plays of some documented series of events that someone was writing down as they happened. They are writings that emerged decades, in Matthew's case, almost a hundred years later, after Jesus' death and resurrection. And these authors were collecting these oral stories that had been passed down, and they're putting them together in a way to help guide and direct the community of Jesus' followers that was taking shape. So the Gospels were written after Paul's letters, and we know from those that the various communities that had formed around the region were finding it hard to get along. So this section of Matthew's Gospel focuses on relationships, on living together. It's often called the discourse on the church. But again, we have to remember that what that word meant in the first century was different in many ways from what we think of today when we say church. But one way that it was similar was that it was made up of human beings. And as such, it would be a place where its members would need to give and receive forgiveness. Now, if we had read the verses that come just before Peter's question here, which, by the way, are the ones that Sanctified Art chose, I called an audible and chose some different ones, the ones that come after Peter's question, But those verses right before these are the instructions on what to do if a brother or sister sins against you. Maybe you've heard those before. You first correct them when you're alone together. But if they don't listen to you, you take one or two other people with you so that there are witnesses. If they still won't listen, you tell the church. And if that doesn't work, you treat them as a Gentile or a tax collector. Now again, there's so much to unpack there, and I'll save that for another sermon. But I just want to point out that there is fascinating commentary on this text that suggests that Jesus' words here are less about church discipline. That idea didn't even exist in Jesus' time but that here Jesus is actually proposing a radical alternative criminal justice system based on reconciliation, not the punishment-based one that was imposed by state or religious leaders. So why Matthew put Peter's question about forgiveness right after this, I can't say. And I do think it's unlikely that this was all part of one fluid conversation, but for the sake of exploring this text today, let's say it was. Let's say Peter is standing there and he's just heard Jesus describe how we make amends with one another. I think Peter had someone in mind. I think somebody immediately came to his thoughts, either someone he had tried to forgive but who kept hurting him, maybe somebody he just didn't want to forgive that he didn't like, maybe someone he had hurt. How many times, Peter asked, how many times do I have to forgive as many as seven? His question suggests he does not expect the answer to be any more than that. Seven was a stretch, right? Jesus' answer is translated some places, as we heard today, as 77 
and in other places as 70 times 7, which is quick, 490. Ding, ding, ding. But whether 77 or 490, the intent of the answer is the same. There isn't a number. Forgiveness doesn't work like that. We keep forgiving as many times as it takes. Now, Jesus' answer here and the parable that follows has often been misused and misinterpreted to suggest that as Christians, we must always forgive, a kind of cheap forgiveness. And somewhere along the way, we threw in the idea that we should forget, although Jesus never says that, as if we could. And much harm has been done to individuals, into groups, by using this passage to demand that victims must forgive those who have wronged them, no matter what. I don't believe that that's what Jesus is saying here at all. Throughout this series, we've been using Peter's story as an example of how faith is a journey that unfolds over time, a journey that sometimes gives us great certainty and knowing, and that others leaves us full of questions and doubts. I think Jesus is teaching us here that forgiveness happens the same way. Perhaps what he means isn't that we should forgive someone for 77 or 490 or some other number of offenses. Maybe what he means is that forgiving someone isn't a one-time occurrence. It's something we must do over and over again. I found that idea reflected this week in the words of some contemporary scholars who study forgiveness. In separate interviews with Drs. Charlotte Whitfillet and Dr. Chiniqua Walker Barnes, both of them mentioned that forgiveness is a journey. And both of them cited the work of another sociologist, Everett Worthington, who distinguishes between decisional forgiveness and emotional forgiveness. Decisional forgiveness, he said, is the moment we decide to forgive. But emotional forgiveness is the process that it takes to get us there. I would imagine many of you can think of examples in your own life of that journey. Dr. Whitvillet says it this way, forgiveness, so much like grief, is an unfolding journey. We've experienced deep hurt because of a loss, and so our emotions, as we process this loss, unfold over time. And we may adopt a different mindset about it and experience a sense that we are moving forward in our meaning making, in our absorption of the reality of it, in our reckoning with it, and in our capacity to tolerate the distress around it, and perhaps even in our sense of hope. And then we can have memories arise and setbacks occur in terms of how we feel. So there's not this neat linear process where you do step A and then step B and then step C and then you're done. The journey has its own twists and turns and there could be surprises. There can be times of incredible effortful intentionality that feel almost fruitless. But there are other times where that persistence can all of a sudden be met with an aha-like revelation, a gift. But those emotions can't be just unfurled at will. Dr. Walker Barnes adds, that's one way I read this 77 times, or 70 times 7, she says. I read it as Jesus tipping his hat to the fact that forgiveness is repetitive. It's cyclical. 
It takes time. We've often treated forgiveness as if it's supposed to be a magic wand that restores everything. But Jesus is saying you might have to forgive that person again and again. The quote on today's centering words from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. conveys a similar sentiment. The larger passage was from a sermon entitled Love in Action. In a broader quote, he says this, in other words, forgiveness is not a matter of quantity, but a matter of quality. One cannot forgive 490 times without it becoming a part of the habit structure of one's being. Forgiveness is not an occasional act. It's a permanent attitude. This is what Jesus taught his disciples. As I was sitting with all this this week and pondering it, I jumped on our Zoom call on Wednesday that the partnership pastors have been doing. Every Wednesday at three, whoever's available jumps on and we just sort of talk about the text and what we're thinking about it. And this week it worked out that the Reverend Dr. Art Cribbs and I were the only two who were able to have an extended conversation on this text. If you don't know Art, he's the pastor at Christian Fellowship, one of our partnership churches. I was struck by so much of what Reverend Dr. Cribb shared with me, but most of all how he named that as an African-American person living in this society, he has to forgive every single day just to survive. He stressed, and Dr. Walker Barnes would agree, that forgiveness is first and foremost an internal process, one that takes place within ourselves, one that heals us. It is, as Art said, a refusal to be a co-conspirator in the harm that has been done to us. It's a process of freeing ourselves. And as he talked about that and as we dug deeper, I kept going back to that parable, which is such a hard one. And let me just say that parables are parables because they're not supposed to have one clear, easy answer. The parables are supposed to be a little bit of a brain puzzle. But I wondered as I heard that story, and by the way, that word that gets translated slave, it really just sort of means employees. So the first person who's forgiven this huge debt, which would have been like billions of dollars, impossible. One commentary says, think of him like the CFO who has embezzled all the money. He gets forgiven but then he can't forgive someone under him who owes a much smaller debt. I just found myself wondering if what binds him is that he cannot receive the freedom he's been given. He is stuck in the systems that Jesus perhaps was teaching us to transcend Systems of retaliation, quid pro quo, and tit for tat. The torture he endures is perhaps internal because he cannot forgive. My conversation with Reverend Dr. Cribbs was a powerful reminder to me that when we talk about the subject of forgiveness, we're not just talking about our one-on-one -on -one relationships. We must consider as well systemic harm that has been done and that continues to be done, many times with no remorse or sense of wrongdoing. And I wish that there were easy answers to those questions. I wish there were a map that led us step by step through any of this, individually, or as a society.
But I think what today's text is telling us is there is no map. There is only love and where love leads us. My guess is when we bring up the subject of forgiveness, you might have some specific situations that come to mind. There might be a person who when you think about them, you feel the knot in your stomach, either because of something they did to you or something you did to them. You might still be struggling to forgive yourself for something. I do believe, friends, that another piece of good news in Jesus' answer, that there is no number, is that we are covered by this ambiguous math of grace because we are forgiven. And when we can receive that forgiveness, we are set free to be on this journey, lifelong as it is, of forgiveness. May it be so. Amen.